participating in the Center for Care Delivery and Integration, and also with several colleagues have helped chair the eHealth Special Interest Group. We are excited to have with us here today Michael Ferguson, Chief Executive Officer of Yogo, who will walk us through the fundamentals of game psychology so that you can utilize crucial building blocks in your own PCMH patient engagement projects. Yogo is a global leader in the application of game psychology and social patterning effects to the design of healthcare applications. Their Empower framework has improved health and financial outcomes for healthcare organizations around the world. Before I introduce Michael, I'd like to go through a few announcements and housekeeping items. First, the PCPCC National Briefing is taking place next Thursday, April 30th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Consumers Union will discuss the recently launched Health Care Value Hub, and you could register for that at pcpcc.org slash calendar. Also, this year, the PCPCC is delighted to co-host a pre-conference session at the CAPG Annual Healthcare Conference taking place June 11th to the 14th in San Diego. The session, Primary Care Innovation and in the Patient Center Medical Home, will present innovative primary care strategies that organizations are using to improve population health and strengthen patient and community partnerships. It will take place on June 11th from 1 to 4.30 Pacific time. All PCPC, mem PC, PCC members uh, can receive a special discount, so be sure to, do, to check out the details and register at capg.org slash conf dash PCPCC. And lastly, today, the PCC, I'm going <laughs> to say one more time, the PCPCC is releasing the final chapter of a five-part podcast series on interprofessional training in primary care. You can learn more and listen to all five podcasts at ccpcc.org. So general housekeeping with regard to the webinar, please use the webinar software to ask questions or provide comments to do this, submit your questions in writing using the Q&A section of the GoToWebinar controls in the last 15 minutes or so. After Michael has finished presenting, I will open it up for Q&A from the audience. Please note that the slides and the recording presentation will be posted to the website within the next 24 hours. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Michael Ferguson. Well, hello, everybody. And uh, thanks very much for, uh, for attending the webinar today and for, for having me here. I'm really excited to be talking to you um, about what it is that we have learned about the effective application of design patterns from games and play uh, to healthcare. We've, our company, Ayogo, has been at this for, well, since 2008. And we have learned, we think, some profoundly counterintuitive things about how people play and how we integrate play um, psychology into our day-to-day -day life. Um, how it helps us make decisions, how it helps us learn, um, how it helps us ultimately develop habits. Um, first thing I want to say, and with we'll this slightly provocative title, um, everything you know about gamification is wrong, um, because there are a lot of things that people think they understand about games. Um, there's a lot that is just on the surface of games that we naturally associate with games, but they are actually not the play itself. And so I'm not talking about the surface layer, but I'm talking about what is actually going on underneath the surface in a game when you play it, the um, underlying science of engagement, if you like. Next slide. Um, just to talk a little bit about our company for a second, I think I've got the control of the slideshow now, thanks. Um, our company is a mission-based company. We are, our goal is to help the healthcare industry transform itself by changing the way that consumers think about their health and how it fits into their life. And I suppose I should say to change the way that consumers feel about their health, because a lot of what I'm going to tell you today um, is about how to stop talking to people's brains, stop talking to their cerebral cortex, um, and start uh, stop talking to their heads, and instead talk to their hearts. 
because we all know that really in the real world we actually make choices with our hearts and then justify them after the fact with our heads. And we've been working with a variety of healthcare organizations, as you can see on the slide, and we've won a lot of awards. Um, they told me I should boast just a little bit, so here is me doing that. I guess I don't have control of the slideshow. Can I have the next slide, please, Carol? Um, so just a little bit about uh, about me. Um, as the co-founder of the company, I get to take credit for a lot of the great work that um, the other um, 30 people here at the company do. And as such, I've been the recipient of several awards. The Pharma Voice 100 is one of my favorites as it's peer-reviewed. Um, and uh, was Social Entrepreneur of the Year a couple of years ago. Also um, a martial artist, but given that we're not in the same room, you should not feel at all intimidated by that. Next slide, please. Guess we're going to have to. Guess we're going to have to communicate, Carolyn, about the slides. Um, here's the problem as we see it from our vantage point. You, the clinicians and healthcare providers and, and healthcare professionals, um, you believe your job is to give consumers the tools they need to manage their health. But the healthcare consumers don't really seem to agree. Next slide. Um, we can move through quite quickly through the slides, Colin, and I'll ask you to go back if you have um, the time that you intuitively choose to move forward is not the correct one. I'm going to move through them quite fast. So um, you use, you give your patients, patients get tools, incredibly useful tools like this, uh, useful, important, even life-saving um, tools that they are expected to use, integrate into their day-to-day -day life. Next slide, please. And they proceed to ignore those tools, instead spend their time with trivialities like this. Next slide. So the question that we ask is why? Why are patients drawn to useless distractions instead of towards applications that can literally save their life? What is actually, um, next slide, what is actually the underlying psychology uh, of what's going on here? And the problem is actually fundamental to how your brain works. You have a 200,000-year-old brain, um, not optimized for a long-term instant gratification world, a world in which you have no scarcity and you are rarely in actual danger. Um, there's very little urgency um, in our world um, today. But our brains grew up, if you like, in an environment where what you did two weeks from now or a month from now or six years from now or the long-term cumulative effect of the food you're eating literally did not matter because you were probably going to get eaten by a hyena tomorrow. And so if you find a giant mountain of Krispy Kreme donuts in the middle of the African savanna, um, you better eat those because you might not get any food. And certainly diabetes and the long-term effects of eating those donuts is not your problem. Next slide. But there's some good news that goes along with this, which is that we do actually need, even in those ancient circumstances, to, to develop habits, to build skills, to make long-term investments in our life and habits. And so we have evolved alongside um, this um, propensity for short-term thinking. We have evolved gamification as a unique strategy, uniquely human strategy, for overcoming this propensity to distraction. So these two children here are playing the oldest and most important game ever. So it's totally fundamental to the human animal, in fact, what they are doing right here, which is they are playing this game, hide and seek, um, which is a serious game. It, this girl and this boy are learning how to hide from predators which is the absolutely most fundamental skill for any mammal living in a dangerous environment, is to hide, and to hide effectively. But how do you learn to hide effectively when you're five years old? You can't learn it all at once. You actually need to make long-term investments in the skills. Um, but as we 
I think we all recognize our brains are not designed for this kind of long-term thinking. It's very difficult for us to do to perceive these cumulative effects. So how do we do it? Well, we break it into small pieces and we play. Um, she's not going to be a perfect hider right away, as this boy is obviously not a very good seeker yet, um, although he may get better over time through practice. Um, also, at the same time, she's learning something very, very, learning other very interesting things about him in the course of this play. She's accumulating invaluable intelligence about is he merciful when he catches you too quickly? Is he a sore winner? Is he a sore? Is he a good loser? And these are um, important things that are learned below the level of consciousness. They're learned. They're, they're picked up intuitively and integrated into our thinking and our life without us even really thinking about it. To play is to learn and is to learn not consciously, but subconsciously. Next slide, please. Now, one of the, we often hear uh, about gamification frameworks and gamification tools and gamification processes, and they often end up um, looking like um, adding points and badges and these kinds of, um, uh, these kinds of, uh, um, outward expressions of game, um, of game, uh, games and play um, on top of other systems. Um, we often get asked, um, "Can you come and help us integrate points and badges into into our programming?" Points and badges are not play. Adding points and badges on top of systems that are not designed from the ground up to be playful, to conform to the fundamental design patterns of of play. Adding points and badges to systems like that is just like welding wheels on a bicycle. Sure, it looks like a bicycle. It's got a seat and it's got wheels and it's got a handlebar. It looks like a bicycle. But I guarantee you, as soon as you get on it and try to go anywhere, you will be bitterly disappointed. In fact, you will be upset in a way that you were not before you got on the bicycle. You're not in any worse situation. You're not going anywhere, just like you were not going anywhere before. But now you're upset about it. Now you feel ripped off. And this is why, this is the problem with taking this outward, um, uh, uh, superficial approach to gamification, not understanding the underlying psychologies. You end up ultimately disappointing, and you end up in a worse place than where you started. The wheels on the bicycle need to turn. It needs to conform to the physics of bicycle, just as if you're going to um, try to add the kind of engagement that you can get through games and play, you need to actually understand what the underlying mechanisms are. Next slide. And so those underlying mechanisms um, are actually pretty um, well understood. Um, there is a whole industry, a multi-billion dollar industry, that has been around for decades doing nothing but trying to understand how to get people to do things that they wouldn't otherwise do. <laughs> how to get people to pay attention and be engaged with systems. Um, in fact, a game doesn't need to do anything. A game, a pure game, needs to do nothing except engage you. That is its only purpose. And so we can learn a lot by looking at those systems and, and understanding how they work. What is the underlying psychology of, of this play activity? And look at how we can integrate those design patterns into our applications. Next slide. And so those design patterns um, are as I say, quite uh, quite well understood. You could quibble about whether they're, I could break these down further or maybe I could merge a couple together, but these are fundamentally um, the five um, key design patterns. If your system has these five things, then your, your system will feel like a game. Um, it may not be a good game. <laughs> lots of games get built every day by people who are expert at building games that are just not fun and not playable and not engaging. Um, it's an art as well as a science. But you can design as well as you like, and if you don't have these five things, your game will not be playable. Um, so it's really important to understand that these five things have to be present. Um, the, the participant needs to be able to make meaningful choices, um, that not, um, not fake choices, not one obvious right way to do it and another one that's just there to take up space, two actual, realistic, different ways to get to the destination, real um, strategy. I think of strategy games. Think of hide and seek. I'm going to use hide and seek as a metaphor um, here because I think it's quite easy to understand. We've all we've all played it, and I want to make it clear also at the same time that I'm not talking just about video games, but I'm talking about any kind of play. So you actually, as you're playing that game, 
you need to make meaningful choices about where to hide and how to hide. Am I going to hide up low? Am I going to um, am I going to um, pick a place that has other distractions in it to make it easier for me to hide and so on. You make meaningful strategic choices. There needs to be obviously a real conflict, some kind of real challenge to be overcome that the person feels emotionally involved in. And uncertainty is a characteristic of these, uh, uh, it is a principle of engagement that I think is not very well appreciated in general. So we spend a lot of time in healthcare applications making things certain, scrubbing uncertainty out of the systems that we create so that the participant always knows what they're supposed to do and they always know what is going to happen. This actually runs totally counter to interest. Think of the most boring things in the world, watching paint dry, watching water boil. What makes them boring is that they are totally certain. You know exactly what is going to happen and when it is going to happen. And that is what makes it uninteresting. If you want to make something interesting, you need to make it a little unexpected. Imagine that when the paint dried, the moment that it dried, it changed to a random color. Well, you might sit and watch it now, waiting to see what is going to happen. Quite a simple change. Add some interest. Um, when the water, pot of water boiled, a random animal jumped out. Now, these are, this is what our, our, our reptile brain is looking for. Is this interesting? Um, is it threatening? So creating interest, creating uncertainty without making it threatening is part of what engages us um, instinctively. Um, discoverability. So um, I can tell you, I'm, we're watch, I'm watching the, um, the NHL playoffs right now, and I can tell you that um, one of the fundamental rules of the game, which you will not find in any rule book, there is no such rule in hockey written down, but I guarantee you it is a rule just as certain as any other rule. But you must you have to know to go where the puck is going and not where the puck is if you want to be successful. This is Wayne Gretzky said, you know, the fundamental rule of hockey is to go where the puck is going. Now I can tell you that, but just me telling you doesn't help. You actually have to know what it feels like. You have to discover it through the course of play. So you have to be playing the game, have it happen to you and go, ah, that's what it feels like. I have just discovered how to how to execute that rule. You may know it intellectually, but you need to feel it. You need to understand it and discover it um, and master it through the course of play. This is, um, this is very important. And then and only then, after these things, do we get to things like points and badges and outcomes. But it's very important that those outcomes are attached to the play itself. So think about Pac-Man for a second. I can tell you that my... Um, that my score, my high score in Pac-Man is 183,211. Um, if I told you that I just got that those points automatically by putting a quarter into the game, um, that wouldn't be very impressive, especially if you were another uh, Pac-Man player. Those points mean something. And if you play Pac-Man a lot, uh, I nearly didn't graduate from elementary school because of Pac-Man. <laughs> like me, you play Pac-Man a lot. You'll know that that score actually means something. It means that I have not mastered the final screen. That is, you cannot get over 200,000 points unless you have mastered the final pattern in Pac-Man. And so me telling you my score actually says something about my play. So the outcome is recognizable in terms of an artifact of play. So we want the, the outcomes to be meaningful. Um, points and badges are typically not meaningful, that they're just, there's no uncertainty to them. They just automatically flow. There's no real special challenge associated with getting one badge or the other. You just need to go through the program. Um, there's not really choices to be made. You just do the next thing and the next thing, and there's very little to discover. So um, you need to think about the underlying pieces of play in order to make it work. So next slide. I'll, um, I'll attempt to show you some of those um, in the context of trying to solve a real problem. So um, maybe you've all seen a map like this. Uh, I've certainly seen um, a lot of them. Um, uh, obesity is a problem, real problem of behavior. And um, let's just think a little bit about how we can get people to think differently, to engage, how we can build a system that is engaging. So I can give you, you know, a diet and exercise program written on a piece of paper. You need to try to increase your, you know, uh, your amount of um, walking to X amount. You need to reduce your caloric intake to Y amount. Um, change the mix of protein and 
um, and, and carbohydrates in your diet and so on. Um, we know this doesn't really work very effectively. Very few people respond to that, um, these kinds of programming. So what have we done? I'm going to give you some concrete examples of what a, a yoga has done to try to wrap some of these, apply some of these principles to this programming. Now, we're not clinicians, so we're not innovating here at all in the underlying clinical program. We're not changing, you know, creating some new kind of diet or new way of exercising. All we're doing is creating um, a game layer that wraps around this content to present it in a more engaging way. Uh, next slide, please. Um, um, so we, I call the one, one interesting way to think about um, the problem that patients have with the kind of content that they get given, uh, I call it the, the, the 10,000 cups of coffee problem. Talk to a patient who needs to lose 50 or 75 pounds. Um, talk to them about 50 and 75 pounds, about how important it is. Um, talk about the big picture. Um, you need to make changes to your life and these big things are going to happen. Um, we talk to them about it as if this is actually the context for their decision making. Next slide. Now, I like to call it the 10,000 cups of coffee problem. We can talk to people about 10,000 cups of coffee, and then they will walk out of our offices, and they will walk out into their real life, and they will literally never encounter 10,000 cups of coffee. They will only ever encounter one. One cup of coffee is the context in which we make decisions. So going back to thinking about this sort of evolutionary basis for our behavior, um, we're not really very good at seeing cumulative effects. We need to make this one cup, and the thing that happens in the context of this one cup, we need to make that interesting and provide the point of engagement here. Uh, next slide. So a good place to start is to think about where the challenges are. Um, physical limitations, uh, lack of education, uh, social support, negative emotions. Um, these, um, these are not very um, uh, these are not cognitive challenges as much as they are emotional challenges. They're things that you feel. You feel the lack of support. You feel your physical limitations. Um, they're frustrating to you, um, and this is why they become a challenge. Next slide. Um, so we need to uh, address these. And w one application that we have built, again, I'm just going to provide examples from our applications because I understand them well. Um, um, this picture it, uh, is an instance of, uh, of Empower that we used to help patients preparing for bariatric surgery, so the morbidly and super obese. These are patients with a, you know, they're a very, very challenging population, a lifetime of bad habits, um, and they have a very challenging program. They need to make really, really big changes. So just looking at getting them to start with being successful in the first 12 weeks, um, building the habits that are going to be useful for them later. Um, uh, next slide. You can see this doesn't have to look very game-like. It just needs to be game-like. So it works by starting with their self-concept, talking to them about them, talking about how they feel, um, help them be, start already successful, create rituals of success to engage rituals that um, provide a, a sense of mastery over time and rewards that are um, that are really useful. Next slide. So the first step is to help the person build a sense of agency. So we get them to create an avatar for themselves. Now, in this particular case, they're actually literally creating an avatar for themselves. This is a, a view of their own body um, that they sit down with their clinician. They actually configure the avatar so that it realistically matches a realistic goal that they might have. You know, this is not Michael looking like Brad Pitt in Avatar, um, which would be a preposterous goal for me at this point in my life, but, um, but a goal that is much more realistic, um, one that, I, that is actually achievable. Um, we call this process loading. So what they're doing is they are projecting into the application themselves. They're, they're creating an emotional locus in the application a place where we're going to accumulate their um, good feelings, their sense of positive progression, and so on. Now, we've used other things besides avatars of the person. We've used um, aspirational images of different kinds. We've used a garden that grows over time. There's a variety of things that you can do here, but the important point that, uh, of this 
piece is to um, establish an emotional center, not a cognitive intellectual center. Usually the center of these applications is the program, but we don't want to make the program the center. We want to make the person's feelings the center. We want to talk to their heart first and talk to their head second. Um, this gives them the feeling like it is about them, that they have you know, real agency, that there is truly something that they can, they can feel the mastery that they are building over time and have it expressed. Um, and uh, the, you know, this avatar moving their focus from where they are right now to where they want to be. And this is one of the great things that games do is they let you see where it is that you want to go, show you that there is a path to get there. They don't show you all the details, but they show you that you can get there. And then they let you find your own path to that goal. All right, next slide, please. So our participant has, um, um, has configured the application. They have an avatar. Um, and these are really simple things. You know, we don't have to build a big, complicated video game. We don't have to make Halo to make this work. We're just applying some of these design patterns to a, what I hope for you will be a very, very familiar system. So the avatar is there. It's the center. It's the most prominent thing in the screen. This is your emotional locus, as I say. And then you've got things that you need to do. You can choose which ones you want to do. You can choose which order you'd like to do them. Um, some of them change every day, some of them stay the same. You can build a strategy, you can begin to develop your own kinds of strategies for how you're going to, um, uh, how you're going to work through what we call the did you do it list. Um, now there's a little bit of um, loss aversion, a loss aversion mechanic here um, which, is, um, uh, which is really useful. There's a little bit of um, uh, discoverability as they discover what the rules are, what are the things they need to do to keep their five magnets in place. Those five colored circles are magnets that are holding the picture of their avatar up. And if they do not complete the program in the correct order, if they don't do the right, um, the right activities, if they don't complete the right amount of tasks every day, they, they lo will lose a magnet. And so they discover very quickly what happens, um, what, what, what aspects of their uh, participation will cause them to lose magnets, and what will cause them to gain the magnets back. But the important thing is you start with them. They belong to you, they're yours, and they're directly attached to the thing that you care about, which is your future self. Um, the magnets disappear, and if you lose all five, your image will fall, and you need to actually go back and reset your goals to make sure that you are setting goals that are achievable for yourself. Um, the five magnets, magnets hold your avatar up, don't lose them. And we have, um, um, we've discovered this is this very, very simple piece, very, very powerful psychologically. The first time you see that red X appear, and it's jarring and ugly in the middle of the screen, you want to make it go, go away, and you'll do what you need to do um, to, to make it go away uh, most of the time. Um, next slide, please. Um, so you start your day with your um, your core activities. There's, again, some rules which we don't need to explain. You discover them. Um, things that are not yet done are amber. Things that are done turn green. And um, there's a little success ritual. So every time you do something successful, you have the opportunity to celebrate. Um, it's a very simple thing, and we only ever use this swiping motion from left to right. Um, when the person has done something good. So that movement is saved for success. And it becomes the punctuation mark on having done something successful is to swipe something that turns green, swipe it from the left to the right, and swipe it off the screen. We give a little animation. Um, we give a little bit of sound. It's slightly different each time. So there's some uncertainty, just a little sprinkling of uncertainty, um, a, a moment of surprise and delight when you see um, something that you, know, you didn't expect to see and you swipe it off the list. Um, next slide. And very importantly, the rewards that you get are not empty. So we, um, this is one of the pieces that we're, um, that we're particularly proud of, for, of this application. So um, what you get, instead of badges that say, congratulations, you reached, you know, you've completed the first week successfully or you you know, you, you've averaged four out of five actions every day for the last week. Um, instead of just a badge, 
we actually give them something that is meaningful. In this case, it's actually a story or um, a kind of game. So it looks like a story. Um, it's a choose your own adventure story if you've ever played those. It's like a little simple game where you make choices on behalf of the protagonist in the story and they go through different circumstances, um, some of them successful, some of them less so. The key thing, though, is that, first of all, all the stories about things that are clinically meaningful. These are stories about people who are patients just like you going through the same circumstances. And we give you a sense of well, agency, um, uncertainty, discoverability as you move through this small game, um, choose making choices on behalf of the protagonist, some of them good, some of them not so good. Um, you get to fail safely <laughs> through the um, through the role of this protagonist as they could make a, a poor choice and you can see what the consequences of that poor choice is, make good choices. Now, um, and, and you can see in the screen on the bottom right, there's different colors. Each color represents a different character. Um, we actually got a writer who previously wrote for uh, Days of Our Lives, I think the soap opera was, to, um, to write the stories about these characters. So they're written in a very kind of uh, melodramatic way, uh, immediately recognizable to people who watch soap operas. Um, we looked at our um, um, at our patient population, and one of the things that we found was that they spent a lot of time watching soap operas. So we used something that would be immediately recognizable, a contemporary social reference, contemporary cultural reference, um, and and created a a reward for them around it. You want to see what happens to the characters. You want to follow them through. Um, one of the interesting things about Choose Your Own Adventures, if you remember playing them when you were a kid, is you typically go through to try to find you know, what is the successful outcome, but then you go back and you follow every other branch because you want to know what happened. And in that way, um, you actually explore the entire problem space. We can show you all the ways in which you, know, you can fail, all the ways in which you can be successful. And our clinicians tell us that uh, it's been very useful to them to um, talk about subjects that would otherwise be very challenging to talk about. So, you know, we like to say issues of the bedroom, issues of the bathroom, um, issues of the kitchen. They can be quite challenging to bring up, um, especially if there's a, you know, maybe a group therapy session or even one-on-one. -on -one. But because we can talk about the protagonists in the stories, well, what do you think about the strategy that Maddie took this week in the story? Um, we have the opportunity to you know, um, create anchor points um, that the clinicians can use to discuss with the patients. Again, this is not complicated stuff. I mean, it's just using narrative, human narrative, stories about real people. It's not, we're not, we haven't innovated there. I'm sure you've seen this done um, uh, um, and maybe even presented to you as a best practice for introducing content. We're just surprised at how, um, how little it's used in the very most meaningful way that it can, so give the person a, a reward for having completed their tasks for the day, and make sure that that reward is actually therapeutically valuable. Um, uh, next uh, slide, please. Um, oh, I've kind of already talked to this slide a little bit. Um, the um, the trajectory of their progress, their sense of progression and mastery through the program that they've got is reflected in the progress of the characters. They emotionally care about these characters and the characters are advancing like they are. And so they feel, they, when we interviewed them afterwards, um, each of the pilots that we've done, they tell us that they actually care about moving the characters forward. Sometimes they came and they did the things they needed to do in the program, not for themselves, <laughs> but for these characters because they cared about them and they wanted them to advance in their lives. They wanted to make sure that Maddie found love or that Brenda found out who was, um, you know, who was the father of her best friend's love child. You know, these are things that they cared about and, um, and they wanted to move the stories forward. Uh, next slide, please. So you might ask, what are the results? So um, you know, these are a summary, obviously, and, and, and preliminary results. But, um, but very, very um, encouraging and promising. So the patients were organized, you know, were selected randomly into three groups. One group got um, the weekly meeting with the coach. Uh, one group got a weekly meeting with their coach. And the Fitbit that we used to track their physical activity, we didn't get them to log everything. We got them to use the Fitbit to, um, to, to gather activity about their, about their exercise. And the third group got the weekly coach, the 
Fitbit and our software. And so that third group, 60% um, of them used the application every day and completed, um, on average, three of their five care plan tasks. That group lost three times as much weight and maintained their weight loss better in our follow-ups at 12 and 16 months. Um, so we're really encouraged by how we, primarily how we got them to come and use the application every day. Um, you know, patients who are in this group often feel that their food and their eating becomes medicalized and they start to turn off, they start to avoid, and you have to see avoidance behavior. But this group was using the application every day. They wanted to be there and they came to be there, at least a majority of them did. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and I'll just sort of give you, I didn't talk very much about social, but I've, I think I've got a little bit of time, so um, I'll, I'll talk about it. Um, social networks um, are, um, are an important part of our thinking about how to design these systems because in the end, there's really no software that can be made, no software you can design that's as interesting and engaging as another human being. You know, our brains are set up to just recognize other human faces, to recognize the distinctive sort of signature in the behavior of, an, of, of another person in the system. Um, now, in spite of ourselves, we orient ourselves to other people, even without meaning to. I, maybe you've had this experience of finding, you know, that people will slowly take on the accent of the people that they're talking to just very subtly or switch their body language. It's part of our nature as pack animals to do that. Um, social networks, though, as they're typically designed, Facebook and Twitter and so on, are publishing-oriented social networks. They're about expressing yourself outward, creating a presentation of yourself that you show to the world. Um, this is obviously great and fun and, and, and people do that, but it turns out as we look at actually what happens under the covers of social networks and whose behavior we can influence the most and what influences their behavior, it turns out that it is the incoming messages that really matter. Messages that come in and um, we built an application for type 2 diabetics on Facebook um, you know, four years ago as one of our earlier projects and we saw something really curious which is that um, everybody had the opportunity to publish what they were doing um, at, in terms of maintenance of their uh, of their diabetes and of their their diet and exercise program on Facebook, but it turned out the people who received incoming messages were the ones that were the most adherent. That there was some relationship between publishing out, um, sending messages of support, or some relationship between the publishing um, and, uh, and, and and changed behavior, but. It was the incoming messages, the people who received incoming messages, even if they never sent any. So the difference between people who received messages and sent, and the difference between people who received but never sent, well, was actually very small. And people receiving messages is what really mattered. So we like to use very, very simple, you know, we don't have to integrate Facebook or, you know, wide open social networks, but simply getting a message from another person that says, and, and we like to, we will do our best to keep them positive. We want to curate and moderate these messages so that the patient is receiving timely messages, um, positive messages, and messages that are clearly from another person um, in support of their um, of their behavior program. If you think about playing Candy Crush, um, one of the things that uh, Candy Crush does right away is it asks you to log into Facebook. Why? Um, yeah, they want you to to promote the game to your friends. Um, that's true, but actual fact. Um, the most important thing that happens is you get an incoming message from your friend that sent you some lives and it reminds you to come back to the game. It tells you that other people are watching you play and they care about your success and they are sending you things. So you have an obligation to live up to their expectations. This is the underlying message. And um, having built a lot of social games um, for um, commercial games, I can tell you it's very effective. This is actually the most effective use of social networks is to get um, people um, people who are playing the game already to encourage each other to participate more. Um, that gets you more engagement and that gets you ultimately uh, more revenue. In our world, we're not interested in, in money, we're interested in changed behavior. So these incoming messages are oriented towards um, patterning the behavior that we want, modeling good behavior, reinforcing good behavior on the part of the patient when we see it because we know what they are doing and we know when they are doing it because we are on their phone. We can make sure those messages are very timely and show up at just the right moment. 
wow, what a score, shows up just at the right moment. It doesn't matter that the person didn't write out that text, whoa, what a score, they just pressed the button. You know that it came from a person and they chose that message for you and um, uh, that turns out to really matter. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. So we have, I'm, I'm just, we can just run through the next couple of slides quickly, um, just so you can see that um, you know, we care deeply about the underlying science uh, here. Obviously, some of this is uh, studies of our own work. Um, and the next slide, um, uh, work of others that we have contributed to. Um, next slide is um, general uh, papers that we found interesting and um, and influential in our thinking. These will all be in the slides that are distributed to you in case you're um, in case you're very interested um, in seeing any of that. Uh, I'm sure you are. This uh, outcomes and evidence-based medicine is what we're is what we're about. Um, and of course, we can make the most beautiful systems in the world, but if they don't actually improve outcomes or um, uh, uh, change behavior, then what good are they really? Um, my next slide it says, thank you uh, for having me, and I'm very pleased that I had the opportunity to show you um, some of our work. Uh, we're very excited about the results that we've seen so far. Um, we think that there are some very simple um, but very effective lessons to be learned um, here that can be applied, we think, in your work. Again, you know, with the underlying um, message that you know, people make choices with their hearts and then justify them with their heads. So the first place to go is to their heart. And um, this is what games are all about. Games are all about how you feel. And um, we could uh, learn a lot from how these games get designed to provide engagement in the first instance and then provide intellectual stimulation in the second instance. So um, on that note, I'm happy to, uh, uh, to take any questions. Great. Thank you, Michael. That was fantastic. Um, at this point, please feel free to use the Q&A section to submit your questions. We are getting some questions in. I, I just, um, before we start with um, the audience questions, I just had a couple quick, one, quick questions for you. One is, um, you know, there is a tremendous trend right now towards uh, fitness style devices, Fitbit and, and the like, and we're, we're seeing that typically there, a lot of those are abandoned within a short period of time. Um, how does this approach and gamification really help with the stickiness of those um, devices and information? And then what, what role does or do you see the care team play with encouraging usage and goal setting with those types of uh, devices. Yeah, excellent, excellent question. And, and I should say, you know, in in the preliminary results that I was just showing you, we found there was no difference in in um, either uh, engagement or outcomes the patients that had just a Fitbit um, from the other control group that had just the coach. So, um, you know, Fitbits alone don't do anything. And um, or any kind of fitness, so I don't mean to pick on Fitbit, but uh, um, the the I think that the the reality is, is that they are producing data. That's what these devices do. They produce data, and um, they produce large amounts of really unreliable data. <laughs> um, so you know, for for whom is that interesting and useful? Ultimately, large amounts of unreliable data. How interesting is it for me to be told, hey, you know that thing that you just did? That turned out to be 9,362 steps. Wow, wow, amazing. I thought I only did 8,444. Thanks a lot for telling me. Um, you know, this is not actionable. It's not useful. Um, in fact, the real value that we see in these devices, and we, and we love to use them, is that they provide us with information, provide us, the developer, um, of the of the software, the provider of the program, some context that we can use. So that the person just exercised turns out to be really, really useful information for us. And we can use that knowledge that they just completed, you know, a long walk or five minutes of chair dancing or whatever it is that they that was part of their, their program. That's a context in which we can um, we can add value. So 
you know, people pick up these Fitbits, there's some novelty to them, or these activity trackers, there's some novelty, um, there's some things to discover, there's some uncertainty, how does it work, what will it tell me? Once you've figured it out, they're just simply not interesting anymore. Oh, well, it just counts my steps. Well, so what? So what indeed? Um, but we, that is us collectively, can use that information to provide the, um, the consumer with some opportunities, some opportunities to act, some opportunity we can provide them with some value in that moment, some, a message of encouragement. They actually, I think most people, don't actually want to know how many steps they're taking. I mean, there's, there's a small number that really care about the details, but most people actually don't care how many steps they took. They just want to be acknowledged for having taken some, and that's our opportunity to step in and give them the right message of encouragement at the right time. The activity trackers are not in a position to know what the right message is what the right next element of the program is. They're not in a position to know that, but we are. And we can use that information in, in, to our benefit and to, the, to our uh, patient and consumer's benefit. Yeah, that's, that's really important. So, so more than just tracking movements, we need more of a strategy, a solution that will help us stay motivated and engaged to make the right health decisions. Um, that's right. Con context, that's, context is really key. And being able to say the right thing at the right time and these devices help us do that. That's, in my mind, what is most interesting and valuable about them. Great. Um, there's some questions regarding cost and approaches to mitigate some of the cost. Have you implemented these types of solutions or programs in, in uh, fairly qualified health centers or rural health centers? And if so, what, what approaches were available to help mitigate the cost of these types of, of offerings? Um, there's, a, there's a lot packed up in that uh, packed up in that question. Um, we have um, we've deployed our software in a wide variety of contexts, um, and um, you know the the thing is that um, you know when I would talk about context, and it's not just you know what the person is doing, but who the person is, and so um, that you know, the application that I showed you a lot of picture it. Um, is deployed um, mostly in the southwest, and um, we spent quite a bit of time um, looking at those patients and understanding them. You know, what are their, what is their, um, you know, what is their cultural context to make sure that we're speaking to them in the right voice, in the right way, that the faces that they see are recognizable to them. Um, this is all really important. It's not necessarily expensive or highly technical work. Um, but um, but very very important to know who you're speaking to and what you're speaking to them about, um, so that you can deliver um, applications um, that they uh, will recognize as their own, where they can you know we can establish that emotional center um, to the application. It it doesn't need to be expensive at all, really. I mean, I mean we we do build systems that um, you know that are complex and provide all kinds of back-end automation to work for very large populations. But the underlying approach, you know, from a, the user experience approach that we take, is actually quite simple and, um, and can be applied easily in all kinds of ways. I mean, I, I pick the example hide-and-seek quite deliberately. I mean, what could be, what could be less expensive than um, creating that kind of what we call a barely game, because there's no obvious rules, there's no obvious win state, um, you know, there's no referees, you know, there's no software that supports it. Um, but it is an instinctive kind of play and understanding that children like to play in this way um, lets us, you know, give them opportunities to play. So we can adapt that simple game, the kind of game that people are already playing, um, can be adapted um, to the circumstances just by understanding, you know, what are, you know, how, how does that game work and, and how can we use it. So. Um, you know, we like those kinds of barely games as a starting point, and you know, you can end up with some very complicated systems that get integrated into hospital workflow systems, and you know, you can you can go a long way with it, and and we are because we think there's a great opportunity to do it. But we like to share um, our design approach because we think it is actually really simple, fundamentally, to um, add these kinds of mechanics. This what we call the Acuto framework agency conflict, uncertainty, discoverability, and outcomes, um, just to use that kind of design thinking in um, putting together programs either for individuals or, or for groups. Hopefully I, hopefully I answered the question. Great. 
Our next question has to do with um, the types of populations that this really works with. Uh, have you seen any differences or meaningful differences with patient participation based on age? Um, this particular um, person works with Medicare populations, and she would like to know which games are most effective for that for that group. Excellent, excellent, excellent question. I'm glad that somebody asked that. Um, uh, it everybody plays. So one of our, you know, hopefully one of the messages that you, you take away from this is that I'm not talking about video games. Video games are a kind of play that is very popular with a certain demographic. Now we've designed for people who are elderly as well as for children. And the only difference, because our brains are basically the same, you know, the only real difference is um, the kind of game that they are playing and uh, the style of game. So, um, you know, obviously there's some cultural differences there. You know, young people grew up around devices and they're very used to using the device as, a, as the primary interface for play and certain styles of, uh, of play are, are very comfortable on the device. Um, if you're talking about older populations, I mean, my mother is a hardcore gamer, and she's 80 years old, and she plays bridge twice a week. If I'm going to design systems that intend to engage her, I should spend some time looking at how she plays bridge. What is it about the bridge game that engages her? What, are the st what is the style of play? How does she engage with the other people around the table? What it is about that style of play that is so engaging to her? And then try to replicate it. We don't need to invent new games here. Everybody plays. Every population has a kind and style of play that they engage in. And we can, uh, once we understand it, we can begin to use those same design patterns in the applications, other applications that we are providing them to uh, provide a lift in engagement. Um, interestingly, the very young turn out to be the most challenging to design for. And that is because there's not very much track record. When you're talk, doing your designing for a 12-year-old, the games they are playing now, they probably haven't been playing for very long. And so it's difficult to see exactly what it is it about those games that they like so much because there's not very much time spent playing them uh, or, or, very, or, or there aren't very many variations on the kinds of games they're playing either because it hasn't been around that long. For somebody who's in their 80s, I've almost been playing bridge almost her whole life. So actually I can really look and see. It's actually quite easy to study. So it um, turns out that it's actually easier to understand the play styles of the old as opposed to the play styles of the young just for that reason alone. Now, the young are more prominent in social media and more prominent in conventional media, so we have that benefit um, as well. But you know, uh, for the boomer generation, we actually know a lot about them and how they play and what matters to them, so we can use that um, to our advantage. Great. I think we have a, uh, time for just a couple more questions. This question has to do with um, consumers' willingness and, and ability to access their health information. Um, part of uh, meaningful use is uh, encouraging patients to to log in and, and get access to their health information. And have you seen any gamification strategies to help consumers understand that information and act upon that information to improve their health? Um, yes. Yeah. So I, I think there's you know it's still relatively early days um, for. Um, Health IT in general, you know, patient-facing health IT is relatively um, fresh field. So there's still um, a lot to learn, and there's been a lot of approaches that have had you know kind of ambiguous results. But um, you know, and so you know, speaking just from our our own experience, um, I said you know the important thing is you know information without context is just not useful. And so um, in fact, you know, because of the way our brains work, you know, we look at any new thing and we say, you know, is is this threatening? Um, can I safely avoid, can I safely ignore it? And um, you know, will it help me survive? And it needs to be obviously in one of those categories right away. I mean this is this happens at the level of the reptile brain. This is not happening at the cognitive level. So right from your first experience of it, you need to give the person the cues that tell them that it falls into some obvious category, that it is non-threatening and that it is interesting. And 
you know, health portals, patient portals for finding healthcare information fail almost universally to do that. So, you know, is it interesting and non-threatening and useful? And um, providing, you know, you don't have to do very much. You know, we want, we always want to try to provide the maximum amount of value. You know, we've got all this health data. Let's give them the whole picture of their whole health and right. But actually, let's just pick the most successful approaches we've seen in our work. Picks just very small, simple things. Let's just talk about, um, you know, your the relationship between your mood and your medication adherence on your prescriptions, for example. So we have some some information. Um, that, that lives in, um, in the healthcare system, and we have some information from the patient, something that they care about, how I feel, is, you could hardly care more about that, um, and connecting the two. It's interesting, it's not threatening, and it's useful. And to do it in small ways first, you know, don't, don't, don't try to get into their, cog into their cognitive centers right away. Let's just start at the emotional level and pick something that is simple and viscerally meaningful to the person, but not threatening and as a way of drawing them in. And once we have their attention, then we have the opportunity to do lots of other things, perhaps. And I think we've got, um, you know, uh, we still still have plenty of time to try to discover what all those things might be. But, um, you know, our experience is starting small and making this really emotional connection right away to the data um, is uh, an important way to get the person to start paying attention. Once you, without their attention, of course, everything you do is going to fail. So you have to try to get their attention right away. Great. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, certainly, it's, it's very thought-provoking around how to use gamification either during the visits uh, or during care management encounters um, and helping consumers and patients with goal setting and, and um, uh, building out uh, their care plan. And it, it's, it's really thought-provoking. And we have a number of questions. We'll try to get to those questions um, after the webinar uh, through email. But I would like to thank uh, Michael, um, yourself, and Yogo for um, all your time today. It was fantastic. And I would like to thank everyone participating on the call. Um, as a reminder, the slides and the recorded presentation from today will be posted on the PC PCC website within the next 24 hours. And once available, you can access it at pcpcc.org slash webinars. And finally, don't forget to register for the national briefing coming up next Thursday, April 30th at 1 p.m. Eastern with Consumers Union. Thank you for participating and have a great day.